Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first review class. Um, can everybody hear me okay and see my screen okay? Perfect. Okay, so as we discussed, uh, I'm going to start with the checkpoints. We can kind of go through that way. There are a lot of questions. I'm not positive we can get through them all. So we'll see how far we get today. And then maybe if we don't think we're going to get through them all next week, then we can look at just maybe everybody sending me the questions they're not, they, they would like to talk about from each of the checkpoints. Um, so we'll get started right away. First thing I want to ask, does everybody have, um, or everybody should have, if you don't, the student resource student resource guide um, that was online on the IBAN site uh, or whichever site in your um, your province. The, there's the student resource guide which gives all the answers to all the checkpoint questions and then there's a practice exam as well as a markers guide which kind of gives you an idea of what the questions look like. Do most people have those or does anybody have those? Okay. <clears throat> Just making sure sometimes people don't realize they're there, um, but they definitely are. And that's really what I'm going to go by, uh, and then we'll kind of discuss some of the things. If you have any questions, certainly don't hesitate to speak up and ask, or you can type and ask whatever you would prefer to do. Uh, I don't mind having discussions about it as well. So, so we can go from there. Anyways, we'll get started. So chapter one, section one, um, <clears throat> the, it's the law, an introduction. The first question, as society evolved, there's two separate systems of law have emerged. Discuss the primary role of criminal law and civil law. So criminal law is dealing with crimes um, and punishing those that are responsible for crimes. And then civil law is concerned with private rights and remedies. Um, so it's not against, it's the private rights and remedies, so just dealing with uh, personal disputes, businesses disputes, those types of things versus criminal law, which are dealing with criminal wrongs uh, against society. So my thought is I'll go through with the six questions and then, or even half of them, and then ask if anybody has any questions. Um, but if you, if something's not clear and you know it right away, just certainly uh, just, just make a note there. Uh, civil law deals with wrongs originating in tort and con contract law. Uh, identify the kinds of wrongs falling within tort law for which compensation may be provided by the courts. So they're looking at um, wrongs in tort law where they're going to actually make a payment out in the court. Um, those are intentional and unintentional torts. Intentional torts being something that was intended to be done and unintentional intentional tort means a wrong that was done but you didn't, you didn't mean to do it, it just it was something you did but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't planned or anything like that. A breach of contract may result in a civil action against an insured. Provide an example of a breach of contract. So the example that they give in the um, student resource guide is when a building contractor elects to, elects to quit a project before completing work agreed in the legal, in the legal contract legal action may be initiated by the owner for breach of contract. So that's the same as if you are hired, um, we can look at me. So I was hired by IBANS to teach this course. If I had quit halfway through and said, no, I'm not doing it, they could have come after me for breach of contract. That's kind of the best example I can give because it's something we're involved in. Um, but anything like that where there's a contract in place and you quit before it's done, that's your breach. Question number three was identify the two main bodies of law relating to both criminal and civil matters and their common law and statute law. Okay, and then the next question follows into that as well. Outline the underlying principles which govern the administration of the following bodies of law. So of common law, uh, the basic concept is that current court decisions must follow those made in cases having similar circumstances. So common law is the rule of precedent. Uh, so whatever was done beforehand is what is done now. Um, that's that's kind of what they use as their guide um, when, they're, when they're looking at cases. 
And then statute law is the written law. Uh, it's done by federal provincial legislation. And then this would amend or supersede the common law. So if common law says um, X is done, if, if there's this situation, then this is what we do, this is the outcome. But then there's a federal or provincial legislation and statute law that says, nope, we do something different than the statute law is the one that is looked at. Number five, uh, A, of the different kinds of tort, of tort damages awarded by the courts, which are most important in ensuring that victims are able to withstand the financial consequences of their losses, and these are compensatory damages. So I think of compensatory as money, uh, changing hands, so compensatory damages are, um, it deals with the financials, so they're compensating the third party, that's kind of how I remember it. So financial compensation that's that's the best way for me to understand it hopefully that works for you and then what purpose is served in awarding such damages um, they're intended intended to compensate the third the injured party for the bodily injury or property damage sustained so they are going to uh, compensate the third party for any damages that they have any damages to any we'll say there was property um, they're gonna to pay to have that property replaced. If they were injured, they're gonna to pay to have, they can't have their injuries fixed necessarily, but they'll pay for, um, it could be anything that involves paying it money, but enough money to give them, put them back to where they were is, is essentially, um, so they're not in a, a worse financial position. And then the last one in this section, was when there is a breach of contract and the payment of damages is seen as inadequate for the circumstances, what other options are available to the courts in dealing with such breaches? Um, so there are some, a bunch of options. Uh, they may rule in the following manner. Uh, so they can provide payment for damages to the injured party. They can enforce specific performance requirements. So if in the um, breach of contract, we talked about, um, say, me quitting halfway through teaching this course. They could, the courts could say, no, you have to finish. That's so they're uh, telling me I have to finish the contract. Um, grant an injunction prohibiting a party to the contract from performing certain acts or ensuring a party to the contract perform certain acts. So they can say, I can or cannot do something. All right. And then they could permit rescission of the contract so as to return the party substantially to their pre-contract position. So they could say the, the contract is pretty much null and void and everybody just goes back to where they were before it happened. All right, one thing to remember in K exams is that typically, I don't know if I've ever seen a question that was not worth three marks in caves one to three anyways. Um, three marks essentially means three points. So in this situation, there's four. <clears throat> you need to know three. Three of them will get you your marks because they're not gonna ask you for four because there's only, you get a mark per, per point that you make. Um, so if you find three of those easier to remember than the fourth one, then that's perfectly fine um, and will, will be sufficient for sure. All right, so that was chapter one, section one. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of those? Is there anything that's unclear? Um, anything you want to discuss a little bit further? I, I agree, Catherine. I think the, uh, thankfully the stuff is pretty clear. I, I, I do believe uh, that it is relatively clear. I think there's a couple chapters in the textbook that are a little bit easier to understand than others. Um, this, one's, this one's definitely one of them. Uh, that's excellent that, <clears throat> that you guys feel like it is clearer. Um, and the nice thing about it is you'll have the recording. 
after the class, so you can listen to it as much as you want. You don't have to worry about taking too many notes or anything like that. You can kind of just listen and, but definitely make note of anything that you don't understand, and then we can we can go from there. Okay, so the next one is I'll get my screen to change is section two. Uh, the, the recording is going to be emailed out because um, the classes aren't recorded, just the makeup classes. So this one will be emailed out to you. Kira, you will likely have it out to you tomorrow morning. I would guess. Does everybody see chapter one, section two here now? Just want to make sure my screen actually changed. Okay, perfect. Someone can, so that means everybody can. <clears throat> All right, so chapter one, section two. Um, negligence is one of the important torts affecting a business's potential for liability suit against it. Negligence must be proven. Identify the three conditions which must be present before the court will be satisfied that the tort of negligence has been committed. And the answer that they give in the in the student resource guide, which is one I'm going to give you first, and then I'll give you my little shortened answer. Uh, so the defendant owed the plaintiff a legal duty of care. The duty was breached as a result of the defendant's negligence. And the plaintiff suffered damages as a proximate result of the defendant's negligence. My easy way of rem remembering this is there was a duty owed, the duty was breached, and the plaintiff suffered damages. So it's a little bit shorter, but will get you on the right track. So if you remember those couple things, then you should be able to pick up um, the rest of it if you need to. If not, you're going to get most of your marks anyways, because those are the most important pieces of, of the question. That is a common question as well. Um, I've seen it on a lot of exams. Number two. The doctrine of strict liability is based on the assumption that certain activities are so hazardous that in the event of injury or damage arising out of them, the person conducting the, sorry, I'm reading the answer, not the question. <laughs> <laughs> the, doc, <laughs> the doctrine of strict, strict liability changes the way in which one's responsibility for a wrong is viewed by the court. Discuss. All right, we'll try this again. <laughs> so strict liability is based on the assumption that certain activities are so hazardous that in the event of injury or damage arising out of them, the person conducting the activity shall be presumed to be legally liable. So certain things are so, da so dangerous that you can expect to be liable for them, a shortened version of that. Um, I use the having a pet lion because it's way out there and I like those way out there examples because I remember them better. Um, they use lighting explosives, um, setting fireworks, which I guess are, is, is really the same thing. Um, is there another one? Just give me a second here. I know I saw another one. This is also um, a good question for the exam. Operation of aircraft. So they may say provide um, examples of activities for which person might be deemed at law to be strictly liable. Uh, lighting fire in the woods, exactly. Uh, so lighting fires, operating aircrafts, lighting explosives, anything that's dangerous, really, uh, you can be held uh, strictly liable for. Okay, uh, number three, although brokers are often involved in the interpretation of insurance contracts, what advice should be given to the client who asks specific questions concerning matters of law? and they should be told to speak with a lawyer or any legal practitioner. Um, that's play, anything that's doing with law, dealing with law, we should not be answering. It should go to a lawyer um, or paralegal, someone like that to answer those questions. Number four, Occupiers may be held financially responsible for bodily injury or property damage to third parties. What factor is critical in determining if one is an occupier? And 
An occupier is someone who has control over the premises. It doesn't mean that they own them. It means they control them or have, have control. So right now I am in um, my office and I don't know if you guys are, but I'm the only person here and I'm in control of this building at this moment. So I would be considered an occupier. Uh, if I had a couple staff here, depending on the level of staff, so, you know, I would say the highest rank staff member would be considered the occupier because they're the ones that are kind of in charge. So anyone who just, anyone who has control over the premises. And then the common duty required of Occupiers Liability Acts focuses on the duty of care to be provided by occupiers to those who actually enter onto their premises. Discuss the extent of the duty owed. And the answer in your book again, it says the common duty owed is a duty to take such care as in all the circumstances of the case is reasonable to see that the visitor will be reasonably safe in using the premises for which he is invited or permitted by the occupier to be there or is permitted by law to be there. A whole lot of words. Um, so the easiest way to remember it in my personal opinion is common duty owed is to take care so that the visitor is reasonably safe while they are using the premises while they are or, or just while they're using the premises or permitted by the occupier to be there is fine but that's really what the common duty is and it's a common duty in in in, in general we need to make sure that people are safe That's right, Catherine. So Catherine just said there's, they have a tendency to do that, make it a whole lot of words. And you can put it in your own words and you'll still get the points. Absolutely. And as you've seen from just a couple of these questions, you can take them from really long answers and make them very short. And you don't need to write in full sentences in a CAVE exam either. Um, they asked for three points, three points, like dash one, dash, so that duty owed, duty breach. I literally would write dash duty owed dash duty breach like you don't need to put this in big sentences and make it extremely long just put it in your own words shorten it up in, in point form that's perfectly fine uh, that's all they're looking for anyways and it just saves the it saves the marker from having to read it all and it saves you from having to write it all unless you're not sure what the question is and then you just write a whole lot of stuff and hope that somewhere in the whole thing you got the right answer Okay, I think we were on number six. The liability of occupiers is limited in circum... <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely just uh, put it in your own words, put it in point form. Uh, that's what I did in all of my... At my very first one, I think I wrote, um, I did it all out in nice uh, long sentences and all this stuff. And then I did my second one, I did, I did an immersion course four and it was like, why did I do that? <laughs> they, they told me, no, just put everything in point form. That's, that's all I need. So, all right, so we'll do number six. Um, the liability of occupiers is limited in certain instances. Discuss the law respecting the liability of a tenant or building owner when injury or damage to others is caused by an independent contractor performing work on the premises. So the tenant or owner wouldn't be liable for the negligence of an independent contractor as long as it can show that reasonable, reasonable care was exercised in choosing that contractor. So they reasonably expected that the contractor would do the right job and that the work of the independent, sorry, it was reasonable that the work the independent contractor was engaged to do should have been undertaken. So. It's as long as the it was reasonable to believe that the independent contractor could do the work and would do the work, then the liability of the tenant and building owner would be limited um, would not be liable uh, if the work is being work being contracted for is inherently dangerous or dangerous um, 
if the tenant or building owner provided defective equipment or if the tenant or building owner says like kind of completely directs exactly how the work is being done in those three situations the tenant or building owner principal would be liable And just give me two seconds here. I have two sets of questions. I got a, I got a separate set here as well. Um, I was just looking through to see if I could find another way of wording that one. But that one isn't here, so okay. So does anybody have any questions about that? Oh, never mind. There's another. Well, yeah, we'll do this page first. Does anybody have any questions about these six questions? Good, que good question. I missed that one. <laughs> so what about 6B? So the liability of a landlord for injuries caused to a tenant and others on the premises. So the landlord is liable in single occupancy buildings for injuries to tenants or their customers caused by the unsafe conditions of the premises. And the exceptions are, hold on, I'm just trying to read how they have this and they don't have it worded very well. So in a multi, no, it's that this is like super, super confusing how they have it written in the student resource guide. So in a single occupancy building, um, landlords typically would not be liable for anything on the premises unless they fail to notify the tenants of the dangerous conditions that they were aware of or ought to have been aware of that existed at the time the lease was made or if the landlord covenants to make repairs and fails to do so after receiving notice of the danger. So those are the two exceptions for when landlords are liable in a single occupancy building. So if they were told that there was something wrong and they needed to make a repair and they didn't, that caused an injury, they would be liable. If the, they knew about something at the, before the lease was made and they didn't tell the new tenant, they would be liable. In a multiple occupancy building, however, the landlord is responsible to the tenant and others for the common areas only. So any hallways in say a condo, we'll look at that, um, or I will, I'll go on an apartment building, I guess is better to say than a condo, but apartment building, any hallways going in between the apartments would be um, the responsibility of the landlord. Parking lots typically, uh, sidewalks, all those things that are common to the Everybody that's in that unit, in the building, would be the responsibility of the, li the landlord. They would be liable for it. Is that a little clearer than what it was on that paper? Okay. Yeah, the, the, the single occupancy portion, I'm not even sure how they... What, I, I don't know what they were trying to say, but... <laughs> Any other questions about um, numbers one to six?
Okay, I don't seem like there's any questions. So chapter one, section two continued. Um, Number seven, a product's liability claim cannot originate on the premises of the person supplying the defective product. What conditions must have been present for a product's liability suit to be successful? It has to have occurred away from the premises of the seller, and the seller had to clearly relinquish possession of the defective product. So they, the seller would have had to actually sell it, give the product to the customer, the customer leaves the building, then there's a product's liability case. Number eight, identify the parties having the right to claim damages for injuries sustained through the use of the seller's product when the action alleges breach of contract. And only the person who actually purchased the defective product and was injured is entitled to sue for breach of contract. All right, so in the breach of contract, only the person who purchased the product can sell, can sue, sorry. And for the tort of negligence, all users of the defective products are entitled to sue manufacturers for their negligence when the use of products results in injury or damage. So the breach of contract answer would be only those who purchased the product could sue, and in tort of negligence, all users of the defective product could sue. Star number nine in your books, this uh, Donahue Stevenson case, I think has been on pretty much every single exam. <laughs> uh, what effect did the 1932 decision read Donahue versus Stevenson have on the way in which the law viewed the responsibility of manufacturers for their products? So what happened was it extended the negligence, the responsibility of manufacturers for negligence to all users. So it's no longer just the person who purchased the product. Um, anybody who uses the product can now sue. That, that was what that case, um, case show, said. Sorry if you can hear me slipping through my papers here. Just trying to see if there's another way of wording that question. So another answer I have, because I, I have my book here from when I wrote it and I have everything kind of written in my own words. Uh, so it extended the right of users of defective products to sue manufacturers for their negligence. That's a little bit easier than that um, example they give you again. <laughs> Uh, so really anybody who's using it, using a defective product can sue. That's, that's the extent of it. All right, so number 10 uh, states three duties of manufacturers. The manufacturer has a duty to ensure a safe design, safe manufacturer construction and packaging, give proper warning of dangers which can occur in using the product and provide instructions if needed. So that's four, you need three. So safe design, safe manufacture, give proper warning of dangers and provide instructions if needed. There's, there's four, pick three, and uh, but that's all you would need. And then there's duties of sellers. So sellers need to be experts about the ingredients and properties of the product they sell, and they need to tell the truth about them. So they can't lie about the product. Number 12, explain when an operation is considered to be completed. And it, can be, it is completed when it can be shown that injury or damage giving rise to the claim, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where they came up with this answer from this question. They're looking at the complete operations liability exposure. That's what they're talking about in the question, which is not how I would have took the question to be. Um, 
So when is an operation considered to be completed under a completed operations liability exposure? And an operation is considered to be completed when it can be shown that the injury or damage giving rise to the claim occurred away from the premises of the person doing the work and such work has been completed or abandoned. So when it has been completed would be when it has been, the, pro the project has actually been finished or the project has been abandoned would be the answer to the question that they're actually asking versus the answer that they give you in the student resource deck. And then number 13 was provide two examples of a contingent liability exposure. So contingent liability exposures can exist when there's work done by persons who are not employees. Uh, so a subcontractor could do some work, it could be faulty, then the contractor could end up uh, being sued for it. And when employees work in another province for longer periods than are permitted by workers' compensation plans. So if they're an, employee, an employee gets injured when they are working out of province, they're gone longer than workers' comp allows, they're still injured, there's no workers' comp, they sue the employer. Does anyone have any questions on any of those? Does anybody have any questions on anything else in chapter one before we move on? Okay, so chapter two, section one, any of the ones that were true and false or um, multiple choice, I didn't type them all out because there was 10,000 of them and I wasn't sure how to make it work so you could see them right. Um, so this one, chapter two, section one is on page 228 of the text. I will read them out as well and when we'll go through the answers, um, but I didn't bother to type them. Uh, so. Number one uh, talks about there are four coverages provided under the CGL policy. So coverage A is bodily injury and property damage liability. Coverage B is personal and advertising in injury. Coverage C is medical payments. And coverage D is tenants legal liability. So we're gonna go through a bunch and try to decide which ones they are. So coverage A, B, C, or D, uh, which would respond to pay. So ambulance charges billed to the insured for transporting a customer injured on the premises to the hospital. So I think ambulance charges as medical payments, all right, uh, that's the answer. But because they're going to get medical assistance, that's a good way to remember that one. Damages awarded to previous tenants of insured who was wrongfully evicted from the insured's premises. And that's personal and advertising injury. So 
the word tenant is in there, which may make you think tenant's legal, but it's talking about wrongful eviction, which is personal injury. That's the reason why that one falls under personal injury. C, damages awarded for death caused a customer who consumed tainted tuna sold by the insured. That is going to be bodily injury and property damage. Funeral expenses incurred by relatives of customer killed on the insured premises. That's medical payments as well. So medical payments similar to accident benefits if you are in um, personal lines at all, or but you would know that from your likely from your own policy. So that, that covers funeral expenses. So medical payments um, fall under accident benefits, kind of remember them that way. Funeral expenses would be under the medical payments. E. Damages awarded as a result of explosion arising out of contractor's failure to properly connect <coughs> gas supply line. And that's a coverage A, bodily injury and property damage, because again, it's property damage. So that falls under your main coverage. Uh, F is damages awarded to hotel resulting from fire to room rented to salesperson of the insured, and that's your tenant's legal. So it's a rental agreement. Um, you are renting the premises. You end up causing it to burn down. That falls under your tenant's legal package. G, damages awarded to competitor after salesperson uninsured staff was found responsible for making disparaging statements which she believed to be true about the quality of the competitor's goods. And that is going to be personal injury, personal advertising injury, because again, the disparaging statement is the reason for the claim, so that it would fall under your personal injury. H is damages awarded when customer's automobile on the premises is damaged by forklift being operated by the insured's employee. That's gonna fall under your bodily injury and property damage, so coverage A. This is property damage again. I is damages awarded for injuries received by customer who slips on the icy steps leading into the insured's premises. That's gonna be coverage A, bodily injury. And then J, damages awarded to landlord for fire damage caused to rented premises by tenant. Again, the word tenant is there in that one, um, but it's caused to the rented premises by the tenant. So that's gonna be your tenant's legal, because your tenant caused it. Does anybody have any questions about any of those? These are kind of common type questions, typically they fall more under covered than not covered that you'll see in an exam, but you, you, you do get them. Um, and in most cases, they, they can be quick points as long as you know what the coverages are uh, and, can, and can put them together. So any questions about any of those? Okay, so number two is all true and false. Again, um, didn't type them out. So A is what they're looking for, is it true or false that the following would be covered under the commercial general liability policy? So punitive damages, fines, and penalties are insured by the policy. Is that true or false? The answer is false. Punitive damages are never covered by the CGL policy. 
because they're designed to really punish the party versus bringing the other party back up to where they were prior to the loss. So there's no coverage for punitive damages. B, product liability exposures are insured on a limited worldwide basis. And that is true. C, the insurer's obligation to defend the insured in any action ends when the coverage limits are exhausted. And that is also true. There is no coverage above the coverage limit. So if you have a 1 million CGL policy, as soon as you hit 1 million, in um, payments, then that's as much as there is, doesn't matter if there's $2 million paid out. D, injuries intentionally caused to others are excluded by the policy. And that says they're excluded by the policy, that is true. Any intentional injuries are excluded. E, the tort liability of others assumed in advance of any claim for bodily injury or property damage is insured by the policy. That is true, as long as it was assumed in advance of the claim. F, employees covered by a workers' compensation plan are also entitled to sue their employers for injuries they receive while in the course of the employment. That is false. As long as you are covered, actually covered by the workers' comp plan, you cannot sue your employer. G, liability arising out of the use of attached equipment on any licensed automobile while at the site of use or operation must be insured under a commercial automobile liability policy. And that is false. The liability can be insured under a, the CGL policy Typically, an auto policy is going to exclude the use of the attached equipment, so they would need the CGL. So the snowplow, and I think we get into this one in the commercial auto chapter as well, snowplow is attached to a pickup truck. While the plow is up, there is coverage. While the plow is down, there is no coverage for any liability that that plow causes. So if you, the, they're plowing a driveway and they hit a fence, that would fall under a CGL policy, not under the commercial auto policy. H, when work is being performed on a real or per, on real or personal property, the care, custody, or control exclusion limits coverage to only that particular part of the property which is being worked upon. And that is false. Because it's in their care, custody, and control, there is coverage for the entire piece of property that is being worked on. So if they're working on a car, so you have an automobile mechanic, has my car put in a shop, that my whole car is under their care custody control and my whole car is covered by them in the event something happens, not just the tires that they're working on because they're changing them. I, um, the only defense available to the insured encountering an allegation or slander of slander or libel is the truth. And that is true. The truth is the only thing that are the only defense they have is to tell the truth. And um, I guess that's the only thing I can say on that one. <laughs> uh, J, medical payments are made only if it is shown that the insured was responsible for the injuries caused. And that is false. Same as our medical payments on our own homeowner's policies, you can voluntarily make the decision to send somebody in an ambulance or anything like that um, from your policy. So they're voluntary. K, tenants legal liability coverages are intended to ensure all losses to the premises which the insured has assumed in contract. And that is false. Tenants' legal liability coverages are there to insure losses. Um, well, they won't insure all losses, but they're insuring the losses of people who are renting hotel rooms or um, if you are, as a business owner, you are in a strip mall, you have a little piece, um, 
that your tenant's legal, but it's only going to cover the things that are legal. If you there's a criminal act, there's not going to be any coverage for that under tenant's legal. Um, so it's not going to insure all losses. L, the insurance liability for damage caused by smoke or fumes from a hostile fire origina originating from their premises is covered by the policy. The answer is true. Smoke damage caused to the stock of a neighboring business by the regular operation of an incinerator located at the rear of the insured premises is insured by the policy. And that is false. So the last one was a hostile fire. You did not know it was going to happen. It just happened. The other one, uh, M, in this situation is a regular operation of an incinerator considered friendly fire because it's in, an, in the, its own receptacle, um, not covered. N, coverage would be provided for bodily injury arising out of the venting of toxic fumes from the insured's premises onto the premises of another, and that is false as well, um, because the fumes are toxic and they're purposely venting them out Thank you. onto another's premises. And then O, except for post-judgment interest, supplementary payments are not limited as to the amount, and that is true. So supplementary payments can be any amount. Would M and N be covered under pollution liability? Yes, you are correct. Does anybody have any other questions about any of those under section one? I feel like we'll definitely get through section three, which would be half the chapters, which would, sorry, not section three, chapter three, um, depending on how long this, this chapter takes, uh, section two, but sec chapter three is very short in the, in just in the checkpoint question part. Uh, so we'll move on to section two. Uh, question one, the insured acquired a controlling interest in another business six months ago. A separate liability insurance policy was not purchased and the insurer under the present policy is not aware of such acquisition. Yesterday, a customer at the location was injured when boxes stocked at the rear of the store fell on her. Would the insurance liability policy respond to provide coverage? The answer is no. There is an, the extension of coverage to newly acquired locations, but it only exists for 90 days or until the expire of the policy, whichever is sooner. So because this was six months ago, that's well over 90 days, there would be no coverage under this policy. The six months gives it away, absolutely. And that's what you're looking for. It would say maybe three months ago or one month ago, anything like that, and that's what you're looking for is that six months versus the, um, it's a perfect example of the exam question, absolutely. Because it's nice and long, right? And that's what they tend to do in, in CABE exams or make the questions a little longer. And then they ask what the, um, <clears throat> are looking for right at the end typically. All right, so chapter, sorry, so number two is true and false. It's on page 239 in your text. I'll give you a second to flip to it, but I'm going to read them anyways. They're true and false again. If I had had a full week to get ready for this class, I would have had them all typed out, I'll be honest. 
but I didn't. Because <laughs> I wasn't sure how we were proceeding with this class, if we were gonna just do it a discussion or if we were doing the checkpoints, so I didn't have anything ready. So that's why I, but I have all six chapters of checkpoint questions right now <laughs> typed out, except these. Um, so number two, true and false A. Claims, oh, and we're under commercial general liability conditions is what we're looking at. So claims are payable in the currency of the country in which the claim occurred. That's false. Claims are payable in Canadian currency only because the policy is in Canadian currency. B, generally when the insurer terminates the policy, the insured must be provided with at least 30 days advance notice of such termination. And that is true. It says generally because in the case of the non-payment, it's less than that. C, when more than one named insured appears on the policy, the insurer must deal with all insured separately on any matters affecting the policy. And that is false. When there is more than one named insured, the insurer must deal with the first named insured only. That's the only requirement. D, the insured is required to forward copies of any demands, notices, summonses, or legal papers received. Failure to do so can result in denial of coverage. And that is true. The reason for it is so that the insurer can prepare a proper defense. E, as the premium charge may be based on actual sales or receipts for work performed, the insurer maintains the right to audit the insured's books. That is also true for that exact reason. F, the premium indicated on the policy is a total premium payable by the insured during the policy period. That is false. because the premium can change depending on if there are endorsements made or any changes to the policy. There can be increases or, or reductions in premium, so that would be false. G, when more than one insured is named on the policy, a breach of policy condition by one insured will not necessarily affect the coverages of other insureds. That is true. Just because one named insured does something wrong does not mean there's no coverage for the others. There would just be no coverage for that person that did the one thing wrong. H, uh, the policy can be transferred to others at any time without the permission of the insurer. And that is false. Same as in any other policy, we can't transfer it. I'll wait until the end of this page to see if you have any questions. Um, Number three, the insurance product is defined by liability policies as being more than just the consumable portion of the item itself. Identify the elements considered to constitute the insurance product. So product includes any goods or products other than real property manufactured, sold, handled, distributed by the insured. So any goods or products other than real property. Containers other than vehicles, materials, parts or equipment furnished in connection with such goods or products. So containers that they're in. So any packaging would be part of the product. And warranties or representations made at any time with respect to the fitness, quality, durability, or performance of any of the above insured items. So the three items considered to constitute the insured's products are the product itself, so any good or product, other than real property, there are containers or packaging, and any warranties or representations. Number four, discuss the meaning of work within the context of the CGL policy. So work includes work actually being done by the insured, work performed on behalf of the insured, materials or parts or equipment in connection with the work and any warranties or representations of the work.
And number five, what factors would you discuss with a client who wants to know how much liability insurance is enough? And you would want to discuss uh, the extent of any previous awards for similar types of business, inflation, the existence of any insurance, any other insurance, where the territory of operations is. So clearly you need higher liability limits in the United States than you need in Canada because the United States do faster and for higher amounts typically. Uh, and the ability of the business to absorb certain losses would be the final thing. Does anyone have any questions on any of those from section two? So we'll move on to section three, which I missed there was a section three when I said I thought we would get through to chapter three. We might not. Oh. We'll see. I don't want to go too fast either. So um, we're under a miscellaneous property policy forms now. Uh, so the CGL liability, CGL policy claims made form is really the one we're talking about. Um, Insurers are concerned with the long tail effects of occurrence basis based liability policies. What is meant by the long tail? And the explanation of it that they gave is actually a pretty good explanation. So when claiming for bodily injury under an occurrence basis policy, a claim can be brought forward at any time. As a result, insurers frequently find themselves paying claims on policies issued years ago. It is going back to previous policies to pay claims, which has created what liability insurers refer to as a long tail. So the occurrence-based policy allows you to go back in time and make a claim because it's the current base. This is when you feel it. Now you're going back. So that creates that long tail because it could be years, it could be 20 years since uh, it occurred originally. So you're going back that long, giving it the long tail. What types of claims have the longest tail? And it's latent bodily injury claims. I was asked what latent bodily injury meant um, in English. <laughs> um, and I explain it really as injuries or illnesses that appear several years after the initial exposure. So years ago, people were exposed to a lot of asbestos. Now they have cancer caused from that. That was, it was probably 20 years from exposure to uh, the onset of the, of the disease. That's a latent bodily injury. So anything that has occurred but doesn't appear until several years later. That's the best way I can describe it. It's an odd word for sure, uh, definitely a weird term, but hopefully that helps. If not, let me know and I'll see if I can explain it some other way. Um, Number three, discuss the three theories which can be used by the courts to determine when an occurrence took place. So there's the exposure theory, which is when the person was in physical contact with the substance. There's exposure in residence theory. This is the assumption is made that the disease or other bodily injury continues after the exposure to the hazardous substance has ceased. And then there's the manifestation theory, which is assumed that the injury occurred when it was recognized or diagnosed. So in that situation with the asbestos, the exposure theory would say that the day you were exposed, that was when you had, um, that's when the occurrence took place. The exposure and residence theory would say, no, it takes place, yes, you were exposed on January 1st, 
but it wasn't until April 1st that you had really had enough exposure. That's your exposure and residence theory. And then the next one is five years later, you end up with cancer as a result of that asbestos. And the manifestation theory says when you, when you were diagnosed, that's when you, um, that's when it was deemed to have occurred. Number four, discuss the two ways in which the claims made policy has helped to reduce the claims costs associated with latent bodily injury claims. And the claims made policy, the insurer only pays for claims which are made during the policy period. The, and a, a retroactive date listed on the policy helps to ensure that the insurer is not paying for injury which occurred before the inception date of the policy. So you might set up a policy December 1st that has a retroactive date, say September 1st. So they would pay for any claims back that far, but they're not gonna go back six years, 10 years, 20 years under a claims made policy. The purpose of the retroactive date is to ensure the insurer does not end up paying for any injury or damage occurring prior to the inception date, which we just said that one. The extended reporting period endorsement provides coverage for claims made against the insured after the policy period has expired, provided they arose from occurrences which took place on or after the retroactive date stated in the policy and within the policy period. So that extended reporting period endorsement would cover you so your policy runs from December 1st to December 1st, okay? Um, a retroactive date was September 1st. Uh, we'll say September 1st of 2017 was your retroactive date. Your effective date was December 1st, 2017 and your policy goes until December 1st of this year. January 1st of this year, you could report an injury that occurred in October because as long as you have that extended reporting period endorsement. I know that's a lot of dates, but I feel like it's easier to put it out in numbers. Um, it should be purchased, and it's the next question, what endorsement should be purchased when a client changes insurers on a claims made policy? And that should be the extended reporting period endorsement should be purchased when a client changes insurers. The reason for that is because even though the policy ex is expired, if it can be shown that the injury occurred while that policy was enforced and you can go back to that policy. So it's kind of like going back in on the occurrence basis policy and that long tail effect. The claims made policies with that extended reporting period endorsement allows you to go back to the policy that actually should have been um, paying out that claim. Now we're into the professional liability section. Actually, before I go to that, does anybody have any questions about that last section? That'll make it easier, maybe. At the end of the claims made policy, is there any reporting period after expiring date without the extension? No, if you don't have the extended reporting period endorsement, there is no coverage. So if policy expired on the 31st and you didn't know about something that happened two weeks ago, you're SOL and you are right. And what would happen is um, 
typically your retroactive date and your next policy is will likely pick it up. Um, but if it was a long time ago, then your SOL. Uh, but that retroactive date will cover you for something that was recent. It's just not going to cover you for anything that happened years ago. Any other questions? I love all these questions, by the way. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to professional liability. If someone's typing something, keep going. That's fine, and I'll, uh, I'll pick it up, don't worry. Um, let's end up professional liability number seven. Professionals are considered at law to possess specialized knowledge and skills. Discuss the arguments that might be advanced by a plaintiff in an action alleging breach of contract against a dentist. And the plaintiff may allege that the professional failed to perform at the required level. And then there's there's three required, three recognized levels of performance. Okay, so complete satisfactory performance means that they've done everything right. Substantial performance means they fall short, but it's only minor, it's not a big deal. And then material breach occurs when the professional's performance is grossly inadequate or defective in some major respect. When performance falls into the category of substantial performance or material breach, the plaintiff might have a right of action against the professional. So it would need, they would need to show that there was a um, substantial, the substantial performance was inadequate or that there was a material, or material breach, anything like that. Um, they could have a right of action if it was complete satisfactory performance and there's no right of action. I've never seen that question anywhere, I'll be honest. <laughs> uh, number eight, un it sounds silly, yeah, I know. You should not be able, someone has a, a fall short of complete performance in a minor respect, should not be able to be sued, in my personal opinion. But that being said, if you're at a dentist and someone, the dentist happens to like cut the inside of your mouth in error, the general person will be like, it's no big deal. You just, you know, something slipped. It happens. Like people move the wrong way. It could have been half my fault. Some people would say, no, I'm suing them. They cut the inside of my mouth and that's a fall short of standard performance. So I can see both sides. I don't, I think it's crazy, but I can see where they're coming from. Yes, couldn't we just say they do their job wrong? Absolutely. When they are not doing their job 100% um, right, you could, and, and realistically that answer should be acceptable. Can I say it would 100% be acceptable to the marker? No, but, because I don't know the markers personally, but I would accept it if you said when they did their job wrong, absolutely. I agree. I think the, satisfact the, the satisfactory performance doesn't need to be mentioned, sorry. It's substantial performance or material breach are the two. So meaning they don't have perfect performance. So could you say um, they have a right of action if the performance is anything other than complete? That works as well. Um, I like that in uh, human terms, yes, as a marker, you would say no. That's kind of funny. You're probably not wrong. Uh, but if you say that the performance, they have a right of action, if the performance was anything other than complete or satisfactory, they have to give you marks for that because you said exactly what they want. You just said it a different way. Number nine. 
number eight, under what conditions might an insured purchase an umbrella policy? This could be purchased if the primary policy has inadequate limits and that you and you've requested to have higher limits but they were denied by the insurer or if there's inadequate coverage. Those are your two main reasons why you would purchase an umbrella policy. So you have an inadequate limits under the primary policy or inadequate coverage. Number nine, umbrella policies have a drop down feature which is unique to them. Discuss how this works and any deductibles that may apply. So the umbrella liability policy drops down to pay claims that are not covered under the primary policy or will extend the limits that are covered under the primary policy. So if you have a million dollars on your primary and you have a five million um, umbrella policy, then you have six million dollars in coverage really. But the, your primary policy is gonna pay out everything first and then your umbrella policy would kick in after. Um, when coverage is provided for losses excluded under the primary policy, the insurer must pay a deductible or self-insured retention. So the SIR is the same as a, a deductible, but that's what they call it in umbrella policies. And you would have to pay that if there was no coverage under the primary policy. Any questions on the rest of those. Okay, so I am gonna keep going. Um, chapter three actually only has three questions in the whole thing. One does have six little parts of true and false, but I think we can probably get through it. We might go a couple minutes over if that's okay. Uh, again, it's being recorded anyway, so I'd like to get, that way we're halfway through with the checkpoints, and then we can look at the other half hopefully on Tuesday or whatever other thing you wanna do. You can just email me or tell me at the end, whatever. So we'll go to check, checkpoints, chapter three, section one, which is on the text, page three dash 13, or the six, true and false. And this is typically uh, the chapter where you see more covereds, not covereds in, uh, in the exam, you'll see some of those. Um, We'll go with A, even though automobiles in Alberta and the Atlantic provinces are all insured using standard policy forms, there are provincial variations in their coverages and exclusions. And the answer is true. The OMPP is a compulsory government automobile insurance plan. And that is false. I don't know what it's called, but it's Ontario they're talking about, um, but it's not OMPP. Or sorry, it's not compulsory government auto. I know that, but I still believe that's in Ontario. <laughs> C, in provinces having government automobile insurance plans, private insurers are permitted to compete for excess coverages only. That is true. D, when automobiles are rented on a short-term basis and a lessee's own automobile is insured by a SPF number one owner's form in their own name, there is no need to purchase third-party liability or accident benefit coverages from the lesser. That is true. It's in their own name. They already have a policy. They don't need to purchase insurance. 
third-party liability coverage is required by the law in each province to be purchased on all licensed motor vehicles. And that is also true. And S, automobiles used in a carpool are deemed to be used for compensation and a special endorsement to the STF number one owner's form or, is, or its equivalent in the other provinces is required. And that is false. Carpools are not deemed carrying passengers for compensation. Number two, what endorsement will be required to the SPF number one owner's form, A, to pay charges incurred by the insured to rent a substitute automobile while the insured's automobile is in the auto body shop for repair or collision damage. That one's the SPF 20 loss of use endorsement. So I look at collision, meaning the vehicle is not usable, so loss of use, it's SPF 20. And to remove third-party liability and accident benefits coverage for losses arising out of the equipment attached to the automobile, and that's the SCF 30, excluding operation of attached machinery endorsement. This is the one that we talked about with the snowplow, and um, they said it would be covered under the auto policy, and we said no, it wouldn't um, once the, when the plow is being used. So that's because the SCF 30 would be applied. Any questions on either of those? I think they're pretty straightforward. Uh, okay, so section, chapter three, section two. Uh, you have suggested to your client, MT Head, that he purchase additional insurance to cover his non-owned automobile liability exposure. He is opposed to this suggestion because he has never rented or leased automobiles in his business. It is his, it is his opinion there is no exposure. Identify the major source of Mr. Head's exposure to a non-owned automobile liability claim. What procedure is normally taken in insuring such risks? And the major source of um, liability would be, or exposure, sorry, would be the employee's automobiles that are used in the employer's business. So if you ever run to the mail for your employer or run to the store for them or do any job for them or you're using your car to go see a client, your own personal car, the company then has a non-owned automobile exposure. These things are usually, um, the coverage can be brought in separately or can be added by endorsement on the commercial general liability policy. And typically, that, typically that's what you see. The non-owned auto exposure goes on the CGL policy. Does anybody have any questions on those ones? I am going to ask everybody to do something. So if you just noticed, um, chapter three, pretty big chapter three questions um, in the textbook. There are three, two discussion uh, questions. Everybody should look at them. Um, make sure you have those listed as something to, um, to remember. So, and I've been like glancing through the discussion questions. <laughs> They're way too big. They're actually not that big if you break them down into what they're actually asking. Um, the, I've, I've looked at the discussion questions as I've been going through, but this was the first chapter that they really stood out to me. So for example, uh, discussion question one says, Ricochet insures the car owned by his business under SPF number one. He was recently in an accident involving an at-fault driver. He sustained severe spinal injuries, 
and is not expected to fully recover. He has just been advised that the driver of the other automobile carries only the minimum compulsory third-party liability limits required by law. As the claim for damages will most certainly exceed that amount, Mr. O'Shea is concerned about where that money will come from. Discuss how this concern might have been alleviated at the time Mr. O'Shea purchased the policy on his own automobile. So really big question. The answer is Mr. O'Shea's broker should have advised him to purchase the SEF 44. Because the SEF 44, what that does is increases the third party liability limits available to the insured when they're in an accident with another person to their own limits on their own policy. So again, this is where we talked about cave questions are really, really long, but the answers are usually really, really short. But the SEF 44 family protection endorsement is a very common endorsement to see on, the, on an exam. So at the very least, remember that. Again, question's long. It's, it's stupidly long, but really they're telling you a story and then they ask you what you, um, what you actually need to know. So that's the main one. Like I would definitely look at that one for sure. Um, just looking to see if there's anything else I missed. We did the garage party. Where's the garage policy section in chapter three? And why was there no questions on it? Am I, did I miss a section? Does anybody know? No, it was under section two. SCF number four, garage auto policy. Okay, I didn't think I missed it either, um, but it is in chapter two, chapter three, and there are exam questions on it because I have some, have one right here in front of me that someone told me that they asked when there was a couple little covers not covered and they asked about, identify the specific coverage endorsement which should have been purchased. And it was talking about the legal, waiver of legal liability endorsement. I don't have, that's all I can tell you about the question. <laughs> this is what happens when people remember stuff when they come out of an exam and they come to tell me. Um, that's the kind of stuff I get. This was on my exam, waiver of legal liability endorsement. And I'm like, okay, so what, is, what do they want to know about it? And they said, well, they just wanted to know what endorsement to use. <laughs> so I write down little, little jot notes. But um, so that is, I have that noted and I have it started, which means I've heard it from more than one person. So I would definitely look at that as well. Um, that is page 316 um, to three, that's crazy that they didn't, uh, 325 is all garage auto and the waiver of legal liability endorsement is on 325. Um, yeah, I would definitely read that section again just because there's no chat, no questions on it at all. And um, I guess their questions on that one are, do seem to fall under the, um, that number two discussion question. Probably if you, if you take it out and look at it and break it down, it does really have everything about um, garage auto, but it's, it's pretty much the whole section question is, the answer is. But obviously that wouldn't be what you're looking for. It's just to help you help you study it. But because it's one, two, three, four pages long, type written, that's what the answer is. <laughs> so just have a quick glance over that. Um, and if you have any questions on it, certainly let me know, and I can go through it. But I don't I don't get why they wouldn't ask it in the regular checkpoints, and then they stick it in the discussion questions. It doesn't make sense to me. But um, does anybody have any other questions? comments, concerns, anything you want me to do in particular next week, or do you want me to just, um, do you want me to just continue on um, doing this to go from chapters four to six on Tuesday, I guess? 
anybody have any opinions? Or you can email me as well. And, and don't hesitate. If you have a question that you want talked about now, like you can email me and I'll respond to you tonight or tomorrow morning. Like don't feel like you need to. Um, some good review questions in the form they put them on the exam. I can work on that for you. <laughs> that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I can give them to you next week. Um, but yeah, no, just if you have anything that comes up, don't wait until class. I, I can't stress that enough. If you, because you're in the middle of studying now and it's crunch time. So you want an answer, you want an answer now. Don't hesitate to email me anytime. Uh, I get my email on my cell phone. Most times I'll respond to you within half an hour, probably less. Uh, so just don't hesitate to reach out and, and ask. And I will put together, um, what I might do is I'll try before the next next class is to put together a little um, a little review, even even maybe a, chat, a question or two. I might take a couple of them from the practice exam still, but kind of based on my best, send them out to everybody um, just so you can have a look at them, and that'll give you an idea of what it kind of looks like. Um, yeah, so I can do that. If everybody's no one has anything else, we can we can go for the day, and we'll be in touch on. Um, Thursday, I'm uh, sorry, Tuesday next week, and uh, I promise <laughs> I'll put together a review for you, <laughs> and I'll email it out before the next class so you have a, a couple to go by. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>